um, I'm going to say good morning, even though it's after, uh, after 12, but still before lunch, so we'll call it morning. My remit from Don, which I just got verbally, although Samson tells me he has one written down, was it should not be a technical talk. It should be about my experience of the LFTS. And, um, yeah, it, shouldn't, uh, it should be really fairly personal. Sorry, Don. Can you hear back there? Hey. Uh, I don't try into the Is that better? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I really can't give the talk with it holding here. If I put it... Is that better? Yeah? Okay, so this is uh, my story, really, of my journey into the LFTS. And uh, it'll become clear why. Can I get this? So I arrived in Edinburgh on the 1st of July, 1989, to take up a position. Um, I arrived in the evening. It looked pretty much like this. I was very happy to get here. I'd driven up from London. It had been a long way. And uh, it was bathed in evening summer sunlight, and uh, I was absolutely delighted. So where had I come from? I grew up in Manchester, um, in the north of England. And I went to an all-girls grammar school. This is a little bit fuzzy. I'm somewhere there in the back row. I'm glad you can't see our, our dreadful pinafore dresses we had to wear. Um, the reason I mentioned that I went to a girls' grammar school is, for me, it was very important in the sense that going to a girls' school, I didn't know there were things girls weren't supposed to do. And it was only actually when I went off to university, I found that some people thought girls weren't good at math and uh, shouldn't be interested in science and such. But having come from this environment, I was a very keen mathematician, and I went off to York, where I did a BA in maths. Um, it was a BA because mostly I just did pure maths. And I enjoyed that very much. I enjoyed my time at York. I enjoyed my degree and all the peripheral activities that can go with a degree as well. And so I thought, I'll keep studying. And I actually went off to Lehigh University, which is a small private university in Pennsylvania. Um, I went to Lehigh, it's a rather strange story. Um, York had an exchange program with Lehigh. Uh, the undergraduates from Lehigh could go and spend a year in York. The undergraduate degree at York, like most English universities, is only three years. There wasn't space to go and spend a year at um, another university. And so in reciprocating, Lehigh made it easy for York graduates to go and do postgraduate study at Lehigh. We didn't have to take the SATs. They would take us on the recommendation of um, or graduate record exam, I guess it would be. We didn't have to do that. They would just take us on recommendation. So I went to Lehigh. Um, and ironically, you know, York, the university is very modern and Lehigh is very sort of looks very old and gothic and is a very beautiful campus as well. Where again, I did mathematics. I did algebraic topology. I was doing more pure maths. And then I had some kind of pang of conscience that I felt I should do something more useful and stop playing these intellectual games. And I moved to London and joined a software company called Logica. Um, and Logica chose to put me in the city division. So I was working in finance software. And I did that for two years. And it, Logica is a really nice company. I enjoyed working for them, but I hated the city. I absolutely, really disliked it. It was the late 80s rampant capitalism, and uh, I really just culturally <laughs> didn't like it at all. And so I wanted to get back to something that I viewed as a purer <laughs> world. Um, I wanted to come back to mathematics or something close to it, and uh, go back to studying, and maybe try and find this balance between the intellectual games and doing something useful. And so that was how I came to apply for a, a job in Edinburgh. And actually, I applied to a job with Alan Bundy. I wasn't successful. He passed my CV on to somebody else. And I was invited for interview, and I came up. And so this was me. I was 25 years old. I thought I was very grown up and sophisticated. I look at this now, and I think I look about 12. Um, <laughs> but you know, this was me. When I arrived, we all used to have to go and have our picture taken. I noticed there was one of Gordon in the same style, done by Peter Tuffy in a little room in the basement of physics. Um, you can see my picture, unfortunately, at one point was used as a coaster. There's a coffee ring here <laughs> going <laughs> around. But, um, yeah, so that was me, July 1989, when I arrived, and I was 
I was actually given a research assistant position because of the experience I had of working in Logica, and I was working on an EU-funded project in the ESPRI program in the Department of Computer Science, and my plan was to do my PhD part-time. So it seemed good, yeah? At the time, the Department of Computer Science consisted of two things. I didn't know all the history, but there was the LSPS, this beautiful land full of things I was more familiar with, mathematics and such. And then there was the computer <laughs> system. <laughs> and I'd ended up in the wrong one. <laughs> this was where my project was, and by default, it's where my PhD was, because by default, if you're working on a project and do a part-time PhD, at that time at least, it was assumed your boss was also your PhD supervisor. So this was where I was and what I was supposed to be doing. But this was where I felt I belonged. And uh, I then wanted to, oh, so sorry. This is mostly just for fun of looking <laughs> at old pictures. I'm exaggerating. We weren't a divided world. We were actually all together in JCMB. This is the Department of Computer Science. Um, you can see Mike here, Gordon, George, George rather, um, Eugenio Moji, here's Gordon. Eleanor Kurz, Alistair Sinclair, Rose KK, yes, Barry Jay's here, Don, um, Sandy, David Pym. Everyone, I was going to say we're all one big happy family. Nobody looks very happy apart from Dorothy <laughs> Welsh here, um, but maybe that's because it was all in black and white, because people are a bit more cheerful when we get to 94 and it's in colour. Um, Robin, <laughs> Stephen. Julian's here. Julian, the most unchanged, I think. The <laughs> Dorian Gray of the LSPS. Um, Mike again, looks a bit more woolly. Um, I'm not in any of these pictures. I'm not quite sure why. I'd like to claim I took them, but I, I no, I didn't. It was too stuffy. But for some reason, I missed all these pictures. Anyway, I wanted to be in the LSPS. It seemed like where I should be, and an accident that I wasn't there. But I didn't know how to join, and I was too scared to ask, <laughs> basically. So I imagined I would have to prove myself <laughs> worthy <laughs> to get entry to the magical castle of the LSPS. So I might have to slay a dragon or two, scale a mountain, or do some kind of <laughs> impossible <laughs> feat to prove my value. Whereas really I knew what I had to do was to prove some theorems. And, uh, so that was what was going to have to happen. What was it I was supposed to be doing? I was employed on this project called the IMSI project. It was to build an integrated modeling support environment. So it was largely a, a, a big software platform we were building to support people who do performance analysis. So this is kind of modeling of computer communication systems to judge how well they're using resources and dynamic properties such as throughput and response time and so a lot of mathematical models are built for, the, for performance analysis, and the idea of this project was to make it easier for the modelers to exploit those models, so that models could be reused if they're handcrafted, they're a lot of work, you want, if possible, to be able to take parts of them, reuse them, build composite models, perhaps putting the output of one model as the input of another model, as you've got different models as parts of the different computer systems. Um, so this was what was going on. Uh, there was also the idea, which I think is still something that's very much needed in the modeling community and somehow almost linked to James Cheney and provenance, of building support for experimentation on models in the sense that you would store a model in an experiment which then said what parameters you had for that particular instance of running the model and what output you got. Um, and certainly I know in systems biology there's still work, people worrying about these kind of issues of experimentation. And the formalisms that were considered for the models were queuing networks, generalized stochastic petri nets, and simulation models. Now queuing mod networks are uh, fairly compositional, but not entirely formal. Uh, generalized stochastic petri nets are fully formal, but not compositional, and simulation models were just pieces of code in this project. So this was what we were doing. Now I look at this, and I see lots of opportunity for LSPS-type work. 
But I was young and naive and felt I had to prove something. And I thought, this is never going to get me into the LFTS. I need to find something else to do. So it was a case of the greener pastures. And I found the Prince Charming that went with the palace. <laughs> and going to seminars and reading, I discovered process calculi. And I fell in love with those. So now I felt I had my route. If I could somehow do some work in that area, I would get into the LFCS. But I had the day job. I had to, to do the IMSI work. I was paid to do that. I was um, doing some research, but mostly programming. Um, I was responsible for the experimentation platform. Um, and what I'd seen from IMSI was there was this problem that uh, people were building these big models, but they were difficult to cope with. Meanwhile, I discovered that process algebra were great. They were compositional. They gave high-level descriptions of systems, which were then um, equipped for formal reasoning. Um, I wanted to put these two things together. And so that was what I did. Um, I actually haven't put the dates in here. It took me a couple of years to get to this, about 1991. I decided this was what I wanted to do. And I came up with the idea of PEPA, which is Performance Evaluation Process Algebra. And uh, so we have a process algebra that now has a semantics in terms of a continuous time Markov chain that can be used to evaluate the properties that we're interested in, the quantification that we need to do performance analysis and other um, things like dependability and availability. And so the PEPA project has sought to um, exploit the difference here. So we have a high level language of the process algebra, which has nice compositionality, and we've got the underlying mathematics. And, uh, Typically in performance analysis, a lot is done with the matrix representation of the Markov chain and linear algebra. You have a lot of problems that they're too big. So having this compositionality in your models is something you want to exploit at the lower level. And that's what we've tried to do. So it's a very simple extension. Essentially, we take a process algebra, as you might be familiar with it, so we have action types and names, but now we have a rate associated with every action or activity, as we call them, and then we have components or agents otherwise. And then we um, use the language to automatically generate a CTNC because the language has some structured operational semantic rules. It gives us a label transition system, which can then be interpreted as a state transition diagram of the CTNC and gives us the matrix Q, which we can then do the analysis on. So what can we do? Well, all the things that you could do with label transition systems, we can now do but with some quantification as well. So reachability analysis, we can't just say whether you can reach a certain state, but we can tell you how long it will take to reach a certain state. Now, that's not going to be a deterministic time. It will be a combination of probability distribution, so I can tell you the probability after 10 minutes you've arrived at a certain state. Um, similarly, for model checking, we can look at properties and say, does it hold with a certain probability in states? or again, how long from a particular starting state until that property holds. So this allows us to do very similar things to what people do with classical process algebras, but now with that added quantification. So I'll just, a little story. This, this was good, I was pleased with this, but I was also quite nervous, and I somehow feared that Robin um, would feel that I'd adulterated the beautiful theory of process algebras by adding in this mucky calculation stuff. And I foolishly, I see now, but I was young, um, tried to avoid telling him until it was all done. And I was once going to a seminar. We used to go to seminars on the sixth floor, and I was in the lift with Robin, and I talked about everything I could nonstop for the lift ride just so he wouldn't ask me what are you working on, which I knew was what he always asked PhD students. Um, and I, I didn't tell him until it was done, and then I gave a concurrency club talk, and he was very supportive, and we both got the data. But I was I somehow very nervous that this wasn't for him to do. So having decided on my project and got the idea, I just had to finish the PhD. Like most PhD students, I felt it was a lot of work to do. I was quite often confused. And basically, it was a long trek, but I got there in the end. And I was very fortunate that at the end of my PhD, I'd applied for a fellowship and I got it. And when I applied for the fellowship, I didn't actually, I think, ask anyone. I just said, 
which will be in the LSTS. And so from then on, I was in the LSTS. And the PFA project continues. I'm conscious that you're all hungry. I was going to talk about this for a little while. Um, so PEPA itself continues. We still work on PEPA. It's been very fortunate to be supported by software tools. That I was very influenced by Robin's uh, inaugural lecture. Is, is computer science and experimental science. It's nice to hear that other people also uh, still remember that and uh, talk about it. So for me, it felt essential that we had tools and we really tried to apply PEPA in practice. I have to admit, personally, I'm not that interested in application, but I'm very happy for other people to make use of PEPA, and so software tools were crucial for that. And Stephen Gilmore was crucial for the software tools that had kept PEPA alive. And we have users all over the world who use PEPA for many different things. And one of the things that have come out of that is that people use it for things that are quite surprising and then come back to you with interesting <coughs> other problems to solve. And many of the other languages, so there are several other languages we've developed via PEPA, um, one called Type, and you see some Paloma and Karma, have come out of people perhaps starting with PEPA and then finding they couldn't do things. And so we've extended it in different ways to try and deal with different applications. So BioPEPA came out of working with people on systems biology problems where they started using PEPA and we found there were just things you couldn't express. And so we devised a new language. Paloma is one where we're looking at locations and spatially distributed systems. And Karma is for collective adaptive systems. Over the years, we've also expanded the types of semantics. We always have a quantified semantics because we always want to do some kind of calculations about systems. But now, as well as Markov processes, we have what we call a fluid approximation where we approximate that Markov process with a set of ordinary differential equations. And this allows us to tackle much, much bigger systems. And so that's at the core of this work on karma and collective adaptive systems. So I got there. I arrived in the, the fairy village and I even got to be director. Um, I think director is a bit of a misnomer. The <laughs> LFCS is something you cannot direct. I think it's more like guardian or, or something, that you try and look after it and foster it for the amount of time that you're given the privilege of having that title. But you're definitely not directing anything. And really the simple question of, of how do you become eligible to join the LFCS it's just because you want to. Officially, I think the thing was, anyone who's a member of the LFCS who says they're a member of the LFCS. But as a PhD who arrived outside, on the wrong side of the tracks, in the scary place instead of the fairy village, that wasn't <coughs> obvious to me. And certainly while I was custodian of the, the LFCS, I tried to, to foster that as much as possible. So I think that's all I want to say in the interest of feeding everyone. Oh, right, sorry, I should, I, I should have talked more about Pepper. I was also wondering that while Bob was talking about it. I think there are some similarities. I think he's very focused on functional programs, which I have to admit is not an area I know very much about. Um, but you could think of ours as being like cost semantics because equally we associate a cost, a duration, um, with each transition within the semantics. It's just that we aim at a particular mathematical model, which is the continuous time model. But th it's the same basic idea that we assume that every activity has a delay and a certain probability associated.
Um, it was somebody called Rob Pooley. He worked in the, the systems group. Uh, so, yes, Fuyo had my, my booklet. My booklet was a different color because I wasn't in the LFCS. This is a technical report I did as part of my work on IMSI. Um, and, uh, you know, you, do <laughs> you did feel the difference. I think now with the informatics, and very much people are in multiple institutes and things, I don't think there's quite... So this is, this is a nice picture. This is inside. What you have to imagine is there's some huge briar fence or something around <laughs> this in true fairy tale style that perhaps when you're inside you don't see, but outside you really were quite aware of. Um, so, for example, the, uh, my interaction was mostly with other PhD students, many of whom are, are here to today still, which is great. Um, but I was very conscious that the treatment for the LFCS PhD students was somewhat better than those of us in the computer systems group. There was no cause for us. So um, George was perhaps remembering an earlier time, but certainly when I arrived, there was no course for the PhD students in the computer systems group, but there was for the LFCS students. There wasn't a meeting like loud lunch for the students outside. You definitely felt a big difference. Now, I, I could, of course, have just gone along for loud lunch, but nobody told me that. Um, <laughs> and so I, I worked hard to work my way in, chop down the briar fence. 